Hello, I'm Lig Flips from the RSPB and I'm here from my virtual reed bed uh, to talk about one of my favourite species, the bearded tit. Now in spring and summer this bird is very hard to see, um, but in the autumn and winter they spring to life again and now is a great time to see them. So it's a fantastic looking species with males being really bright and colourful, females not so but still just as stunning. Um, but that's enough of me talking about them for a second. Um, here's a bit of footage from RSPB Radipo Lake in Weymouth. absolutely fantastic and hopefully you can see why that's one of my favourite places to see a bearded tit. Now that video was filmed last winter uh, back when we didn't have all of our current restrictions so I thought I'd best highlight that um, but RSPB Radabow Lake isn't the only place you can see them. Uh, they're found on RSPB reserves up and down the country including Hamwall in Somerset, uh, Newport Wetlands in South Wales, uh, Minsmere in Suffolk, uh, Titchwell in Norfolk, uh, Black Toft Sands upon the Humber, and they're even found in Scotland on the Tay Estuary. Um, but another fantastic place to see them is RSPB Leighton Moss. And I met up with John Carter, who works there just the other day, and we chatted all about the bearded tit. I've been sort of talking about Weymouth a little bit and Radapo Lake in particular, which is like my favourite place to see them. And I've, I've said to others that I think it's the best place to see them in the whole of Britain. But I, I, I bet you've uh, got a slightly different opinion, John, have you? I have really, yeah. I mean, uh, this is... I mean, where I first ever saw bearded tits. Um, you know, when I was a, when I was a young, you know, it, it's, a, it's a very special place for me. But now we've got such a, a, a great opportunity for people to come and see them. When they when they kind of start, you know, using these grip trays that we'll talk about in a while, it is a it really is a special place. I don't think there's anywhere better personally to see them, but you know. Well, we'll, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> um, but yeah, and another another thing that we've got to clear up first though as well, John, is that. Some people call them bearded tit and some people call them bearded reedlings. Now, which, which camp are you in? I tend to call them bearded tit just because I always have done, even though, you know, um, the, the taxonomy of bearded tits is pretty complicated and it keeps changing. Um, they were thought to be parrot bills at one point. That's no longer the case. Um, we know they're not tits. Um, I think they pretty much belong in their own family. Kind of closely related to larks, I think, is the latest uh, thinking. they they're a really hard bird to see normally, aren't they? But, you know, you've, you've mentioned already about the grit trays and in October they become quite visible. So, um, yeah, so what, what's up with those grit trays? Well, I mean, they are very difficult to see because they live in dense reed beds um, and it's not that they're shy it's just that the, 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 the habitat that they, that they live in is just very difficult to kind of penetrate you know you can't get into it um, so um, twofold really the benefit of the grit trays is, is for the birds and it's for, for people really uh, for visitors to, to, our, to our sites um, the insects also belong and then when they kind of become kind of scarcer to find harder to find uh, the, the, the kind of insect food as autumn approaches they have to change the diet, so they start eating seeds. So they eat reed seeds that sustains them through the winter, so they don't have to migrate, essentially. So they can live in one place, and they just have to change the diet in order to be able to do that. Um, so in order to do, you know, to, to digest the seeds, they have to kind of uh, eat grit, you know, or fine kind of gravelly sand, which they take into the crop, and that grinds open the seeds so they can digest the pulp because they've only got quite small bills they can't crack the seeds open um so when they're in this process this transition of insects to to seed diet they need to take quite a bit of grit on and they'll do it for several weeks um and they used to come onto the pathways frequently but you know with people up and down they never really got settled and so we've put these trays out kind of like a bird table essentially with this fine gravel on and we've set it back in the reed bed with a nice viewing area and the birds come onto the gravel to take it in and people get fabulous views of it. So it's for helping the birds and, uh, and it's helping people get a really great view of an otherwise pretty tricky bird to see. 
Mm. I've actually got a little bit of footage, um, which we'll we'll go to in a sec, of, of them feeding actually on yogurt trays at Leighton Moss. But I've got to, got to add really quickly before we do that, though, because, um, you know, there's lots of reserves with bitter tits. And I've tried to put grit trays at Radapo Lake before, and they just didn't work. We just could not get those birds to use it. So, you know, that really? it's not, yeah, it's not a simple science, I don't think. I mean, we've got lots of paths there, and they were using the paths like they, like they obviously do at Leighton Moss as well. But, yeah, we, you know, we really struggled. So, um yeah, hopefully, you know, it's an ambition of lots of rebed reserves to get you know, what you've got set up, up and running because it's an amazing thing to see. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll cut to that right now, actually. So that, that, that clip was absolutely fantastic, John. I can, I, I'm kind of starting to warm to the idea that Lake Moss is actually, <laughs> you know, one of the best places, but I'm going to stick to the one of the best places for sure. Um, now, I noticed yeah, well, a lot of the birds had um, little colour rings on, and, and I know that uh, through some of the things I've seen down here, that they do this bizarre thing called an eruption, and that sounds incredibly dramatic, doesn't it? That they're, you know, exploding or yeah, something. Yeah. But, you know, explain a little bit more about what's going on there. Every now and again, they will just decide to kind of erupt or sort of kind of leave a site and go and try and find new areas to, to kind of colonise, really. They are quite spread around the country and, and quite isolated because they are so dependent on reed beds and reed beds are still really quite rare kind of habitats in this country. So it's hard for them to kind of find an adjoining reed bed to kind of colonise. So they have to get up basically and clear off and find a new site to, to colonise. Here, um, we've had a, you know, a couple of kind of big eruptions over the years where, where birds kind of disappear for, for you know, um, uh, for, for a while and then come back again um, because presumably they can't find anywhere too close. And there was a, a couple of birds um, a few years ago that made it over to the other side of Morecambe Bay and were found at Walney Island, um, which is a nature reserve there. And then they kind of ended up back here again. Um, so that, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of strange phenomenon. It's, it's a way of kind of expanding their range, but it's difficult when you're so reliant on one type of habitat. The colour ringing has been really valuable in studying the actual population, success rate, survival rate, that kind of thing. Um, and John Wilson, our former warden here, um, he, he's still very much involved in uh, monitoring the colouring birds and still actually rings them. So, you know, he's, he's kind of got this, just decades worth of data about these birds. It's, it's incredible, really. Yeah. yeah. No, it's great to, you know, it's, it's great that we can base all this on, on a bit of science as well. That's kind of really important. And, you know, and I, and I think personally, the, the future, you know, it's actually looking quite bright, I think, for bearded tit. You know, there's, there's more and more reed beds kind of starting to establish, you know, the, the, the work, you know, we're doing, the RSB is doing, you know, up and down the country in creating reed beds. And, you know, down, down this direction in Somerset, you know, there's, there's the, the Somerset levels now are full of reed beds and that's all habitat that bearded tits can colonize and um, you know I think it's looking really really bright uh, you know would you agree? Oh, absolutely it's the same with Bitten, you know and, all, and these other kind of reed bed specialists um, you know that 20-30 years ago we were looking at you know pretty catastrophic future for these things you know uh, but through that reed bed creation and management and improvements in management by RSPB and another conservation organisation, we're really improving the, the whole future of these of these very dependent species. And uh, yeah, bearded tits, uh, hopefully, you know, they're on an upward curve now. Um, and as long as we don't get, I mean, mild winters is probably helping them as well, you know, as well, you know, those cold winters, the populations tend to, to get battered a little bit. So there's a lot of positive stuff, really. Uh, and it's great to have a positive story where um, nature conservation is concerned because we hear a lot of doom and gloom uh, so it's nice to have something really positive to focus on. So huge thanks to John there for joining me the other day to talk all about bearded tits and you know it definitely is a positive story you know they're doing well at our reed beds and that is down to our supporters and members who fund our vital conservation work so a huge thank you to everybody who helps us out um so that's it for now and we're going to leave you with some fantastic images of some stunning bearded tits hope you enjoy thank you very much <laughs>